Let me ask you this morning, uh, if anybody knows what the number one fear of people in the world is. You got it. Number one fear is not death. Isn't that weird? Not death. Not like, you know, marriage, not falling in love. The number one fear uh, for like the last 20 or so years running is public speaking. So right now I'm terrified, as you can tell. No, I'm not. I never have. That's never been a fear of mine, ever. Even as a kid, I was fine in front of people, talking in front of people, singing in front of people. Just God, you know, knew what he was doing, I guess, when he made me the way he made me. So but fear, the number one fear usually is public speaking. And so that's what we're going to talk about today in a manner of speaking is public speaking. Really what we're going to do is we're in this series called Church and State, and we're talking about faith and politics and how they go together. So the last two weeks, we've kind of been building up this idea. We've been asking this question, can Christians, should Christians particularly, uh, engage in political things, in political life with social issues? Uh, and I hope that I've made it clear that the answer, based on Jesus' you know, personal life and his ministry, is yes. Christians can very much. We are not out of the system. We're not, we're not out of the loop here. We are able to engage politically and with social issues. So what we're going to look at today, though, is the how to that question. How, then, do we appropriately, as followers of Jesus, if we are followers of Jesus, and if you're, if you're here or you're watching and you're not one, you can kind of keep tabs on it. Okay, if they're a Christian, they should probably do these things, and not to judge them, but to kind of see, okay, is their faith real? Or is it just what they do on Sunday for an hour once a week? So because, and this is hard. What we're going to say today, I'll say, first of all, you probably know everything I'm going to say already. Uh, you probably heard everything I'm going to say already. You probably expect me to say everything I'm going to say already. So I'm not going to like open up this new revelation. Oh, wow. Okay. It's pretty basic stuff. However, it's a good reminder for followers of Jesus because it's hard to do this. Our culture is increasingly divided, increasingly opinionated, increasingly at each other's throats. That's all we see on TV are these talking heads yelling at each other across the screen there about their political view or their opinion on this issue or this thing or this belief. And that's typically not the way we should do things in general, especially if we're a follower of Jesus. Our, our conduct, our communication should look different. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to look at four uh, criteria, four characteristics of Christ like communication. If we're a follower of Jesus or we're kind of looking at this whole thing about faith, how should a Christian conduct themselves in their communication, especially when it comes to hot button issues, personal issues, political issues, and social issues? How should we conduct ourselves? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. And the first one, as we get right off the bat, is the first characteristic of Christ-like communication is simply positivity positivity. That may seem like weird, but it's in the Bible. Philippians 4 verse 8, Paul writes this. He says, now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. So this is the last thing he wants to write to this church. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. So Paul says we should think about these types of things. And when it comes to communication, I believe that we should communicate these type of things in this type of way. How we frame, how we view the world and issues and people, as we talked about last week, looking at the person instead of their position, that's part of this positivity thing. We want, because here's the thing, isn't the world negative enough already without us adding to the negativity so why, how, how about we confront that negativity that is pervasive with some positivity in the way that we approach even difficult personal topics or divisive issues? We can approach those things in a positive way. It is possible to do that. Uh, you know, even Jesus in Matthew 7 says, let your light shine before men so they can see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. So he's even saying, hey, we, we can and should come at things with a positive attitude in a positive way. And the big way that we can do that is to be positive is I want us to be more about what we are for than about what we are against in general, okay? I want us to be more about what we're for than about what we're against. Now, by default, if you are for something, you're automatically against something else, right? So I get that. I understand that. However, uh, how we approach it is everything. Be, be more about what you are pro than what you are con, what you're for than what you're against. 
And I want to give a nerd alert real quick. Uh, I've been going back through this document, this book called The Federalist Papers. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Uh, It's awesome. I love it. It's amazing. So it's this series of really, (laughs) I know you're laughing at me, not with me. I get it. Um, But what this is, uh, it's a series of basically periodicals in the newspapers from the 1780s. Uh, written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. And what they're doing uh, is they are saying, hey, here's why the Constitution that we j- are talking about, trying to get done here, here's why it's good. Here's why we need that. So I've been reading through that. I do it every couple of years. It's a lot of fun. But what I read in the very first one, in the Federalist Number 1, written by Alexander Hamilton. Okay, I'm going to try out for his part one day. I'm just auditioning. Um, He said this, I'm not throwing away my, no, that's not what he wrote, sorry. Uh, In Federalist number one, he says this, talking about positivity, I know I got off track here, but he says this, for in politics as in religion, so he's combining these two things too, he did it first, okay? In politics as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes or converts by fire and sword. Heresies in either can rarely be cured by persecution. He's saying in, you know, 1780s language, what I'm saying today, be more about what you are for than what you are against. It's way more effective if just over time, by my words and my conduct, I prove my positions to be the best positions rather than trying to scream at people and shame them into their, you're wrong, your position's terrible, let me give you 17 reasons why in a very angry tone. We typically default to that position, but that's not a positive position. And it's way more effective, again, if I just prove that my position is better, that my, my position works. And it's not that I'm trying to convince anyone of anything per se, but that's a way better strategy than trying to yell at someone about why they're wrong and their position is stupid and evil if I just prove, hey, you can see that mine works and yours really doesn't, so something needs to change here. But that's a, that's a positive way to be for something and against something, but positively, okay? Uh, one more scripture on this, and then we'll move on to the next one. Colossians 4, 6 says this, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So salt is a preservative. So before refrigeration, you would you know, pack meat and salt so it wouldn't go bad. And so that's what Paul's saying here. Our speech should be that way. It should be preserving. It should be positive. It should have that effect on people that we're not tearing them down based on their beliefs. Again, going back to last week a little bit. But that the better way, the more positive way, really the more effective way of communicating, especially as a person of faith, is in a preservative type of way, in a positive way. And that starts with even how we frame certain issues and how we look at people and their Issues. So again, the first characteristic here of Christ-like communication is positivity. The second one is honesty. I want to be positive in what we say and how we say it, but also honest in what we say and how we say it. And this is actually one of the like Big Ten rules here, right? Written down Exodus twenty sixteen. God says, "You shall be- you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor." Now, the immediate context here is really legally, you don't want to lie about your neighbor if you're under oath talking about accusing them of something that they did. What's also implied here is not just false witness about your neighbor, but we want to avoid false witness to our neighbor. So again, using kind of cleaning up the language here, we just want to be honest in our communication with people, in what we say. Uh, And so here's the thing. We don't intend, I don't think, most of the time to be dishonest. Like we, don't, we don't have this master plan, oh, I'm going to lie to them about this political issue. We usually don't come at it that way. But I want us to go even one step further. Again, if we're following Christ, let's go one step further than the bare minimum requirement here. So instead of just not intending to lie, let's intend to be ultimately honest in what we say and in how we say it. So let me, let's, let's break down one more verse here for just a, a couple of minutes to talk about this honesty issue. It's James 1.19. James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, he writes this. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must, there's three things here. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. If there's ever a life verse for political things, this is it. This three-step process, not easy to do, but important that we pursue this. So let's look at these three things here for just a minute as we look at honesty in our communication, okay? 
So I want to talk about the, the middle one first. He says, be slow to speak. Man, that's good advice, right? That is so good. And I, I, I'm going to, again, we're talking about communication. So I'm not going to limit it to speech. All forms of communication should be honest in their intent, uh, in, in what we are actually saying or typing or texting or posting or tweeting or retweeting or sharing, whatever it is, should be honest in nature. So here's a few things to consider when we are engaged in political debate or discussion, no matter if it's in person, online, virtual, Zoom, doesn't matter, right? Think about this. Before I send that or say that or share that, do I have the facts on this? That's part of honesty and communication. Am I, am I presuming that this is a, a, an, a factual statement when in fact it's really an opinion statement? I have to be honest in how I present what I'm presenting and what I'm saying. Do I, is there, are there facts to back this up? Is it factual? Is the source reliable? So, I mean, I've seen so many things on, especially Facebook, Twitter, just people will share links to this news story and it's a fake news story and they don't know it. I love when that happens because it's so funny. It's like they didn't get the joke and they thought it was real and it wasn't. And so, like, is, is the source reliable? Is it biased one way or another? And I'm, you know, claiming that it's not biased. That's the issue, I think, a lot of times with what we share is, well, oh, no, it's totally unbiased. Well, no, it is, but we're not claiming that it is. That may, be, that may not be completely honest in how we share things or how we uh, communicate. Uh, and I would even say, let's, let's even think this way. And this is, a, you may think this is too nitpicky. This is too goody two shoes. I mean, you can be as dishonest as you want, but I'm going to be as honest as I can, okay? So what we're saying here is, is this post, is this thing I'm going to share, is this article, is this tweet, is this link, is it at all misleading, okay? Is it claiming to be something, but really it's not? Or is what I'm saying, I'm, I'm Maybe I am trying to be a little bit dishonest to prove a point, or I'm going to fudge the numbers so that I will convince them, that sort of thing. We want to be slow to speak. We want to ask, go through these kinds of questions internally before we let out whatever we're going to say communications-wise. I think that's an important thing that we should consider. Uh, then the first thing he says here is be quick to listen. Another, another good one. Uh, so we want to be honest even in our listening. So we talk about communication. Communication is two ways, right? It's speaking and listening. So if we're not listening, we're not really being involved in honest communication. And so one thing that I really think is important uh, is active listening. So most interviews on television are not, do not do this. They have their five questions they have to get out in se a seven-minute interview. So they're not listening to the person they're interviewing very well, or they'd follow up on something that they said, or they'd be like, are you sure about that? Which we'll get to that in a minute, too. So we want to we avoid that in our personal communication as much as possible. We want to actually listen to what they're saying so we can actually hear what they're saying and respond to what they're saying instead of just saying what we're already going to say. Or in a conversation, and I've been guilty of this too, where I'll be thinking about what I'm going to say while they're talking, and then I totally don't know what they're saying, and maybe what I said is what they just said, and I just look like a complete idiot. And so I, but active listening is honest listening. It's part of this communication. Is quick to listen. And then the last thing he says here in this verse is we need to be slow to get angry. So honest in what we don't say sometimes, honest in our listening, and then honest in our responses to avoid being overly angry or causing anger or offense. The key here is what we kind of hinted at a second ago. It's important that we, in conversation, in communication, that we ask clarifying questions instead of making accusations or assumptions. It's easy to make a blanket statement about somebody that you don't know that well, or it's easy to make this totally black and white thing about this very nuanced topic, and that's really not how it is. We want to maybe ask them, what, okay, when you said that, what did you mean by that? Instead of just saying, well, I, you said this, and you're evil now, or you said that, and you're wrong, and you proved my point that you're stupid, you know. We tend to do that, but it's way more helpful if we ask clarifying questions in communication instead of just making accusations or assumptions, because you know what happens when you assume, and I'm not going to say it because we're at church. So what we want to do is avoid a defensive posture in communication and avoid being offensive in our posture. And that comes through our honest responses, being slow to get 
angry. Okay, so we want to be positive in our communication. We want to be honest in our communication. And then this might be the hardest one. We want to, we want to show humility in our communication. This is hard to do, but it's, it's maybe the biggest one. Let's read this. Philippians 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture in the entire Bible. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Uh, Paul again here, a lot of Paul today, he writes this. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Well, what attitude is that? Here it is. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. We sang that this morning. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' whole mission in coming from heaven to earth showed incredible humility. The way he lived his life constantly showed incredible humility. He was the smartest guy in every room he was ever in, yet he never took that position. He never let you know that, yeah, I kind of have, you know, I know everything. You know, I'm, I'm God. I mean, he did say that, but not in an overbearing, proud way. He was humble. And it says, even to death, even to the most brutal, horrific, excruciating death. That's where that word even comes from. Uh, crucifixion, the word excruciating, it's the same root word there. So the, the most brutal death as an innocent man ever, yet he showed great humility. And Paul says here, we should strive to show humility in this same way. So we should strive for that in our communication. So here's the thing. We all have views, right? We all have opinions, we all have issues that are near and dear to us. We all have certain beliefs, and we want them to be right, don't we? Don't you? I mean, you don't want to hold on to a belief that you think is wrong. You would change that belief. So we want to believe that what we believe is right and correct and good and the best that, that I know, the best that I experience, you know? And so we, we have them, and we want them to be right, and that's fine. But like Jesus, we should be willing to discuss those topics and express our beliefs and opinions in humility. So let me just give you a few uh, phrases to kind of put in our hearts that what I'm going to call a humility checklist, okay? And these are some hard things to say and think, but I think it's important and it, it builds this humility, okay? So the first one is this, uh, I don't know everything. And that's a good place to start in a conversation with someone. And you might be a scholar in that area. You might have given your life to study this particular topic. You may have experienced this thing. That's why you're so passionate about this issue. However, it's a great position to start from to just admit, I don't know everything. There might be things I'm going to learn, even from the other person that I'm debating about this issue, which that's one of the things we'll talk about again in just a second. So it's a great place to start. I don't know everything, and that's a hard one, okay? It just, it just is. This one is maybe even harder, the fact that I was wrong. Like maybe as you talk to someone about an issue or you talk or you debate them, uh, you're like, hmm, I probably, you know, my view really stinks. My position is wrong. So we can be stubborn and hold on to our position that we now think or know is wrong or not as good as theirs. That's pride. That's going to get in the way. That's going to not lead to where we want to go. So in humility, we have to say, I was wrong. That's okay. Or maybe even in the way that we communicate, we may have to apologize to some people at some times. I was wrong in how I handled myself. I was wrong to like, you know, punch you in the face uh, when I disagreed with you. That was wrong of me. So we have to be humble enough to say even I was wrong. I'm going to, now I won't make you all say it with me, but just, you know, what, in your own time, in your own way, when it's appropriate. I have to say I was wrong. And then similarly, another phrase that keeps us humble is this idea of I learned something. Again, in that communication, I thought I was right, but their argument was way better. 
Their reasoning was way more persuasive. Their logic followed and mine stopped at this point and I'm trying to get from here to here and they just took it out from under me. That's part of communication. It's part of discussion. It's part of debate. And if we come at this, if both parties especially come at this with these other attitudes, then it's going to probably lead to that. And that's okay because I've already said I don't know everything. I've already admitted before I was wrong so I can admit that they taught me something I didn't know. It's not a bad thing to say this person I disagree with, they made a great point and I either need to change my viewpoint a little bit on that or uh, figure out to strengthen my own argument for the next time. So we have to be willing to say I learned something. And then another thing um, with communication is, where am I? I lost myself. Oh, okay, this is a big one too. Maybe I misunderstood them. Again, we're in our, in our arguments with people, we are usually so black and white. And we, the first thing that we hear them, that we think we hear them say, we attribute all this stuff to that statement. And maybe we misunderstood them. Maybe they didn't communicate that right. So going back to what we already talked about, that's why asking those clarifying questions is a big deal. It's important because maybe you didn't hear what you thought you heard. Or maybe when you say it back to them, they're like, no, 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 no. What I was trying to say was, that happens all the time, but it won't happen if we just shut it down by now saying, oh, well, that's your lifelong position because you said it one time in that conversation eight years ago, so I know that's how you are now. No, we have to continue to talk. That's what communication is. We have to be willing to say, maybe I misunderstood. That's where clarifying questions and active listening really come into play practically. Here's another, this is kind of a two for one with communicating with people. We have to say, you know what, maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe they're having an off day. They came across as really rude, but that's not like them. So I'm not going to now say they're a terrible, rude person. I'm just going to maybe say, maybe they got stuff going on that I don't know about, and they came across as rude. Maybe they had a temper because their home life is a wreck right now, and so they were kind of short with me. We have to just give people the benefit of the doubt sometimes. And then we have to turn it on ourselves. Sometimes we don't live up to this really high standard of communication. So we have to say, you know what? It was an off day. That was, that was really bad. That was really rude of me to act that way. So it's just an off day. Now, if it's how we are, we just need God to change who we are. Okay. Now, if we're all the time, you know, short, we have temper, we're always irritable, argumentative, unkind, impatient. If that's how we communicate all the time, it's not an off day. It's that we really need God to do something in our heart, like big time, to to change us and make us better than we can make ourselves, better than we want to be ourselves. Only God can do that. But more often than not, it's just uh, either they're having an off day or maybe I am. And it's okay to admit that. And then the last thing to kind of sum up this sort of humility checklist with communication is this idea that po body's nerfect, right? <laughs> po body's nerfect. People just make mistakes sometimes. You'll catch that later in, during the Chiefs game. It's okay. When Travis Kelsey drops a catch, you'll say, po body's nerfect. Even Travis Kelsey, you know. Uh, when, you know, when Mahomes gets sacked, the offensive line, po body's nerfect, guys. It's okay. Here, that's, it's just the truth. Grace is involved in our lives. It it needs to be. It must be in how we think about ourselves and others. They're going to get things wrong. I'm going to get things wrong. We're human. We're all equal on that front. And so as we come into communication with people in humility, again, even on sensitive issues, on personal topics, on our opinions that I'm going to dig my heels in and grip my teeth. I'm not letting go of this opinion because I've always had it even if it's wrong, right? In humility, we have to be better than that. We just do, especially if we're followers of Jesus. Okay, so again, we're going to get to the last one, but let me just recap. We want to be positive in our communication, honest in our communication, and humble in our communication. And the fourth one is sort of cheating because it sort of encapsulates all the other three and puts a nice bow on it, and that is the fourth characteristic of Christ-like communication is love. That's like an obvious one. No dust even. Let's go home. We're done, right? But it is. This is the key to everything. It's the root, I believe, to the other three. And that's why we saved it for last. We're going to run through a few verses here, kind of sort of popcorn style, and look at it and talk about it for a second and just see how this kind of comes together full circle. Romans 13.10 says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. It goes back to a little bit of last week. Who's my neighbor, Jesus? Who am I supposed to love? Everybody, including, Jesus says, our enemies. 
So if we truly love them, if we're positive in our communication, if we're honest in our communication, if we're humble in our communication, that's being loving. Even to people with which we disagree strongly. Even, maybe especially to those people. Because again, going back to last week, if I'm nice to people that agree with me, so what? Big deal. Like kids do that. <laughs> you, know, so that's not, you don't win a gold star for that one. However, if we can exhibit these characteristics, even in these tense situations with these antagonistic people, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay dividends. It's love. It fulfills the law. Colossians 3.14 Paul says, above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. What does he mean, above all these things? Well, if you go back up to the beginning of chapter 3, he lists a lot of great traits, some of which we've talked about today. Let me list them for you. He talks about compassion, have compassion, have kindness, have humility, have meekness, have patience. But then in verse 14, he says, above all of those other amazing, godly, helpful traits, put on love. Why? Because it binds everything together. That's what we're talking about. Love is the core. It's the root of all of these other traits. Without without love in my heart for people, I'm not going to be positive most of the time. I'm not going to be honest most of the time. I'm not going to be humble most of the time. It starts right there with love above all these other things. Two other ones we'll combine really quickly. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God. That's the best kind of tater you can be is an imitator, (laughs) as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 1 Corinthians 16, 14, let all that you do be done in love. That's why we're talking about all communication, email, tweet, Post, shares, Skype, Zoom, whatever communication you have should be done in love with these other traits then that closely follow behind. So he says, walk in love. In all that we do, exhibit love. So in every form of communication, at every time, with every person, it's not up to us what they do or what they say or how they behave or how they react, or overreact, or how rude or hateful they are. I cannot control anyone but me, and you can't control anyone but you. And I'm going to get ahead of myself, but that's just, that's kind of the theme of today. One more scripture, and this is the big one. This is from the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians 13. Here's how Paul begins that chapter. He says this, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. And if you're with us this last Wednesday, we talked about spiritual gifts. This is right in the middle of his discourse on spiritual gifts. Chapter 12 lists them. Chapter 14 talks about them in great detail. This chapter is in the middle of them on purpose for a reason. It's not because he got distracted with a different topic. He knows, and he even says, you can speak in tongues all day long. You can prophesy all day long. You can have faith that moves mountains all day long. You can even be a martyr for your faith. But if those things aren't done in and through and because of love, it means nothing. Here's what that means politically. You can have the best, most godly views and opinions that you can base on Bible verse after Bible verse, but if you don't have them out of love and express them through love, those views don't mean anything. You can be right in even uh, in what you think, but if you're wrong in how you communicate those, it means nothing. It's pointless. We're wasting our time. It doesn't matter how influential your discourse might be. It doesn't matter uh, how persuasive your argument is. If it's not done in and because and through love, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So we have to exhibit love. Again, no matter what other people say to us or about us or how they react to us or respond to us, our job, our position is to always come from a position of love. Always. Love is the key. And so let me give you this idea as we begin to wrap it up. The whole sum of what we're saying, the whole reason, the whole heart behind this topic today of Christ-like communication is this. It's one thing to not be liked because of your views. It's another thing to not be liked because of how you express your views. That's a big deal. 
It's one thing for you to not be liked because of your views. You cannot control that. But it's a different thing entirely to not be liked because of how you express your views. And that is within our control. They may not like what I think or believe about this topic. Tough cookies, brother. But if I express and explain and dialogue about that topic in this type of way, I can control that. And really, in reality, you're probably going to get a better response if we do this anyway. Again, that's kind of the secondary thing here. It's the right thing to do anyway. It's the right heart and motivation to have. And really, it might actually pay dividends. Because if we as Christians in our little pockets of the world can talk differently than the rest of society does, and the people on the news shows do, the people on the internet do, people are going to take notice. Wow, you said that really well. I am more persuaded because you calmly explained your position rather than yelled at me about my position. Again, it's the, it's the proper thing to do, but it really can have great uh, results. So, should we have opinions? Yes. Should we have and hold positions? Yes. Should we share them and express them? Yes. There's nothing wrong with any of this, but we have to do it in this way, with positivity, in honesty, in humility, and in love. Because in our supercharged, highly divided, highly political culture, we want our speech, our conduct, our communication to be a great example of who Jesus is to honor God, because that in the end is really what matters the most. People may not be persuaded, even if you do it the right way, not our job, not your problem. Our job and our problem is that we communicate, that we have a heart and a position in this way that we've talked about today, and it all comes through a heart of love.